history of mathematics. We're up to lecture seven. So that means uh, it's the start of the officially the fourth week and we start chapter four. But I wanted to just um, discuss two topics that I had uh, already mentioned a bit in chapter three, uh, but I want to go through them again. So, uh, and they're both very important. Uh, and it's really interesting how much this material would fit into uh, some kind of enrichment or uh, even middle school or high school math class sometimes. So we have what are called uh, the regular polygons. So this is a polygon, which is two dimensional. Um, with um, all edges equal in length and all angles equal. And you need both. Um, so for example, a rectangle and a square have equal angles. They're all right angles, but um, they're not the same. Uh, actually, a rectangle and any two rectangles have equal angles, but they don't form. Um, you're not. It's not. You don't have a regular. Just saying equal angles is not enough to ensure that you have a regular polygon. Uh, so this has equal angles, but it's not um, a regular polygon. Uh, so this is a rectangle. Okay, I don't even need that. Rectangles equal angles, but it's not regular. A rhombus has equal sides or equal edges, uh, and it's also not a regular polygon. This has equal angles, but the sides don't have uh, the same length. This has equal sides, but the angles aren't all the same. The only figure where one of the two conditions is sufficient is a triangle. If you have an equilateral triangle, it's equal angular. And if you have an equal angular triangle, it's equilateral. But this is a regular polygon in two dimensions. And in three dimensions, a regular polyhedron, the, plur the plural in Greek is polyhedra. These are figures where um, uh, the faces are the same regular polygon and the solid angles at every vertex are equal. So the simplest example is a cube where each side is a square, all the squares are the same, same uh, edge length and same area. And what are the angles? So how do you define an angle, a solid angle? So if you have three planes meeting at a vertex, you just add up the sum of the angles of each of those planes. So each of these, at each corner of the cube, each you have a square, you have three squares. Each square has a right angle. So the solid angle of a cube is three right angles, three pi over two, or 270 degrees. So in a cube, every angle, every solid angle has angle measure three pi over two. If you have a, uh, so this is the cube. If you have the tetrahedron, tetrahedron is a figure where each side each face is a regular triangle. And in each vertex, you have three triangles touching that vertex <coughs> in an equilateral, equiangular triangle. Each angle is pi over three. So you have one, two, three. So the solid angle at uh, each vertex of a tetrahedron is um, pi. Okay. 
Now, any questions about that? This is um, sort of three-dimensional geometry, which, I mean, you live in three dimensions, but most geometry that you do in school is two dimensions. Even though this three-dimensional geometry goes back uh, at least 2,500 years. Hmm. Okay. Um, hmm. So how can you try to classify or enumerate all of the regular polyhedra? Right? This is the... object we're interested in here. So at every vertex, okay, so let's do it this way. So suppose the face of the regular polyhedron is an n-gon. This means a polygon with n, so it's a regular n-gon, right? as a polygon with n uh, edges. And if you have a polygon with n sides in general, the sum of the interior angles The sum of the interior angles is what? Well, you can think of it like this. If you take the center and you draw lines from, not a, the center, a point in the interior to each vertex, if you have n sides, this divides the triangle up in the polygon up into n triangles. And each triangle, the sum of the angles is pi. So the sum of all of the exterior angles plus this is pi, is n times pi. But this you have to subtract because you just want the sum of these angles. So it's n pi minus 2 pi or n minus 2 times pi. So in any polygon with n sides, the sum of the interior angles is n minus 2 times pi. And if the n angles are equal, then there are n of them and they add up to this. So it's n minus 2 over n times pi. So, so a regular n-gon has every interior angle equal to n minus 2 over n pi. So, for example, when n equals 3, and you have a triangle, three minus two over three, pi is pi over three. And that's exactly what it is. In a regular triangle, each angle is pi over three. What about n equal four? The regular polygon with four sides is a square. 4 minus 2 over 4 times pi is pi over 2. And of course, in a square, each interior angle is a right angle. They're pi over 2. For n equal 5, that's a regular pentagon. The interior angles, can't draw this very well, but 5 minus 2 over 5 times pi, that's 3 pi over 5. Or 108 degrees, if you like degrees. So in a pentagon, each interior angle is 3 pi over 5. N equals 6, you have the regular hexagon. You know, 6 minus 2 over 6 times pi is 4 over 6, or 2 thirds pi. 
So in the regular hexagon, each angle is two pi over three and so on. And n over n minus two over n is the same as one minus two over n times pi. So as n gets bigger, this gets smaller, the angle gets bigger. So these angles are strictly increasing. If you prefer degrees, this is 60 degrees, 90 degrees, 108 degrees, um, 120 degrees. These numbers are getting bigger. Okay. Now imagine you have a regular polyhedron. So you have a certain number of these regular polygons touching each vertex. So suppose you have the case when, so case one, uh, the sides or the faces are triangles. So each angle, so you have each face is a triangle with plane angle. For a triangle, it's pi over three. Suppose you have um, n faces, or let's say k faces, at each vertex. In that case, the solid angle is pi over 3 added to itself k times, k pi over 3. So you need at least three faces at each vertex. So if you have three faces, if k is equal to three, the sum of the angles is pi. So this is number of faces, this is the solid angle. It's three times pi over three. If k is equal to four, you have four pi over three. By the way, so this is this, the regular having problems completing your request. Please try again later. If you continue to have issues, please contact support. The regular polygon with three triangles at each vertex is the tetrahedron. The regular polygon with four triangles at each vertex is the octahedron. What about five? If you had five triangles at each vertex, the solid angle would be five pi over three. And there is such a figure, it's the icosahedron. Suppose you have six triangles at each vertex, then the solid angle would be six times pi over three or two pi, which means you wouldn't have a solid at all. You would be completely flat. So this is impossible. And if you have six or more, any greater than or equal to six faces, you couldn't have a solid angle. So if you're going to have triangular faces, the only possibilities are tetrahedron, octahedron, and icosahedron. What about if each face is a square? Square faces. So if you have k faces, you get a solid angle, which is k times pi over 2. So if k is 3, that's the cube. If k is greater than or equal to 4, this would be at least 2 pi. It's impossible. So there's only one regular polyhedron with square sides, and that's the cube. What about a pentagon? Suppose you have um, pentagonal sides. So each side has angle 3 pi over 5 each face, and if you had k faces, you would have k times 3 pi over 5. So 
if k is 3, you get 9 pi over 5. That's less than 2 pi. That's possible. And that is the pentagon dodecahedron. If k is bigger than 3, you have an angle more than 2 pi. That's not possible. And if you try to use a, a figure, uh, a face that was a regular polygon with six or more sides, the angles would be too big. So this is really Euclid's proof that there are exactly five regular polyhedra. It's based on the fact that at every vertex, the solid angle has to be strictly less than two pi. Otherwise, it wouldn't fold in on itself. And in each of the five possible cases, there does exist such a regular polyhedron, the ones that have been enumerated. Okay. Any questions about that? No. So that really is a very, very pretty piece of geometry. The only other thing I wanted to just review for a minute, because it's in the homework, is the Euclidean algorithm to compute the greatest common divisor of two integers, a and b. So that means given integers a and b find the largest or the greatest integer d such that d divides a and d divides b. And the Euclidean algorithm that does this is just the process of successive long division. So let me pick two numbers at random. I don't know. Let's see. Let's make it up. I'll leave it up to you. Someone give me a number A. Um, 837. Lovely number. Thank you very much. And give me a number B. Any number. Smaller than 837. Someone um, pick a number. 207. Nice number. Okay. We want to find the greatest common divisor of these. So we take 837. We divide it by 207. Right? This actually goes in four times. And it leaves a reminder, a remainder of nine. So 837 is 4 times 207 plus 9. Then you take 207 and you divide it by 9. Huh. It goes in exactly 23 times. Wow. So 207 is 23 times 9 and a remainder of zero. The last positive remainder is the greatest common divisor. So the greatest common divisor of these two numbers is nine. Let's just check. Nine into 207, what we just saw, um, that goes 23 times. Nine into 837, <clears throat> nine nines are 81, 27, three, All right? So 837 is nine times 93 and 207 is nine times 23. And the GCD, the greatest common divisor is nine. Usually it takes more than two steps to get the answer. This happened to work out easily. But I didn't pick the numbers, so 
I'm not responsible. Um, all right, any questions about that? So everyone should know the Euclidean algorithm and this is, and there's some homework problems about that. I also picked the numbers at random for the homework problem. So I don't know whether they'll, it'll turn out to be easy or hard. We will, we'll see. All right, any questions? about anything so far in chapters one, two, and three? In that case, we go on to chapter four, which is on Archimedes. who was arguably the greatest mathematician in the history of the world. Um, he lived in the town of Syracuse in Greece. Um, as far as we know, he was born about 2,500 years ago, 287, and he died in 212. And these numbers are smaller because these are BC. Euclid was in the 300s BC. So Archimedes was a couple of generations after Euclid. And we can assume he absolutely understood, knew everything in Euclid. And he did a number of amazing things and... Um, If you read the chapter, the first few pages are about his life. He was very interesting. He, uh, so when he worked on math, uh, he really concentrated, uh, as they say, and didn't do anything else. According to Greek biographers, sometimes he did nothing else than math for so long, people would grab him and throw him in a bath to clean him up a little bit. Um, and uh, but he also was a kind of applied mathematician and engineer so um he devised all sorts of weapons of war to help protect his city against attacks by other uh greek armies um yeah anyway, if you i really recommend you read the the beginning of this chapter carefully because his life is fascinating and his death was fascinating um the Greek, the other Greek armies were uh, attacking his city of Syracuse, and he basically by himself could uh, fight them off because he invented these machines. Syracuse is on the ocean, on the Aegean Sea, I guess. And he had these machines that were like huge machines would reach out over the walls of the city, pick up a Greek warship, lift it up in the air, turn it over and drop it and, you know, kill everybody and sink the ship. And he had all sorts of catapults that would throw huge rocks at the land forces besieging the city. Um, and somehow the Syracusians thought that because of Archimedes, they were invulnerable. And at one point, they had some celebration and got drunk and failed to uh, have watchmen on some part of the wall. So the invading army broke in and they had been given orders to bring Archimedes back alive because the Greek general wanted to meet him. Um, and a Greek soldier found Archimedes, but Archimedes was working on a geometry problem. And the soldier said something like, you have to come with me. And the guy, Archimedes, is supposed to reply something like, I'm busy doing math, leave me alone. And the soldier got angry and killed him. So that was the death of Archimedes. Anyway, uh, it's it's interesting. Um so, and we start this chapter with the great theorem. Often in these chapters in the book, the great theorem comes at the middle or the end of the, the of the chapter. Um, and this has to do with um, the number pi. So they teach you in school that the circumference of a circle is pi times the diameter or two pi times the radius. And the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. And in both the formula for the length of the circumference and in the formula for the 
area of a circle, the same number pi occurs. Uh, but that fact is actually a discovery of Archimedes. Um, so, so what did the Greeks knew? So before Archimedes, the Greeks knew that if you take two circles, so this circle has say diameter D1 and circumference D1, and this circle has diameter D2 and circumference D2, they knew that the ratio C1 to D1 of any triangle was the same. So if you take two different triangles, the circumference over the diameter of one is the same as the circumference over the diameter of the other. So there's a constant. This is so ratio of circumference to diameter is constant. So there's some number, whatever it is, and you take any circle, the circumference divided by the diameter is that constant, and we call it pi. Call it pi, right? So we don't know what pi is, we just know that for any, and the Greeks knew this before Archimedes, if you take any circle and divide by its diameter, you get a certain number, and you get the same number no matter what the circle is. So we call that number pi, right? whatever it is. Okay. So for any circle, circumference is pi times the diameter. Now, the Greeks also knew something else. Uh, the Greeks also knew that if you looked at the areas of the circle, call this area A1, in this area A2, the ratio of the areas of the circles to the diameter. Um, well, that was not constant, but if you took the area divided by the square of the diameter, that number was the same for all circles. So here we have this big circle, area A1, diameter D1, a1 over D1 squared, that's a number. Take the smaller circle as area A2 divided by its area squared. And these two numbers are always the same. So this is some other constant. Right? And that's and we don't know what it is yet. So let's call it K. Right? So there's some constant K such that the area is k times d squared. Now, as an aside, we know the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. And the radius is half the diameter. So the area is pi over four d squared. So we know that this constant k is equal to pi over four because they told you in you know elementary school or somewhere, the area of a circle is pi r squared. But the fact that this number pi and this number pi are the same, that's what Archimedes proved. Um, so, Okay, that's, so that's the great theorem. So the great theorem is, um, well, we're going to prove this in two steps, but the great theorem is if this constant K is pi over four. Right? 
we know that the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter is constant. We know that the ratio of an area of a, area of a circle to the square of its diameter is a constant. And but we don't know the relationship between these constants. If we call this constant pi, this constant k is going to be pi over four. That's what we're going to prove. Okay. Any questions about what we're about to do? Um, you know, it might be a little bit strange because we're about to prove something that you've known since for a million years. Um, but someone had to prove it and it was Archimedes who did it. The Greeks before Archimedes, Euclid could not do this. Okay. So there is a kind of intermediate step in proving this, which is the following. So, <coughs> suppose you take a circle and you have a circle with an inscribed regular polygon. So you have a triangle, a square, you have some regular polygon inscribed in the circle. So actually, let's just uh, I'll break this up into two pieces. Let's just consider first a, a regular polygon. with um, n sides. So each side so let's say the side has length b. So the perimeter, well, you have n sides of length b, it's called the perimeter q, is n times b. What about the area of this regular polygon? Well, the regular polygon has a center and you can draw the line segments from the center to each vertex. So you divide polygon into n triangles. What is the area of each triangle? Well, the area of a triangle is half the base times the height. What is the height? Well, you draw the perpendicular from the center of the polygon to the side. Call that H. So this H is called the apophthalm. It's just the height of this triangle. So the area of the triangle is a half the base times the height. So the area of the polygon is going to be n times the polygons, the sum of n triangles. Each triangle has area a half bh. So n times that is the area of the polygon, which is one half h n times b. n times b is the perimeter of the polygon. So one half h q. So the area of the regular polygon 
with n sides, each side of length b, is this. You may not be able to calculate h easily or at all, but in any case, that's a correct formula. So if you have a regular polygon with n sides, if its perimeter is q in the apophthegm, that is the distance from the center to each side is h, that's the formula for the area of the polygon. Okay. Now, what is the next thing I want to say? Suppose you have a circle. You could inscribe a regular triangle in the circle. And if you bisect each side and draw the corresponding rays, you get a regular hexagon inscribed in the circle. And if you bisect those sides, you get a regular figure with 12 sides inscribed in the circle. And what happens as you inscribe a polygon with more and more sides? Right? For example, even if you just start with this triangle and you go through this process of bisecting each side and using that to draw an inscribed polygon with double the number of sides, the number of sides increases. And as the number of n of sides of the inscribed polygon increases, each time you're adding something to the polygon, the area of the polygon gets bigger, increases, and as the number of sides increases, it gets, it approaches in the limit, the area of a circle, of a circle. So as you have a regular polygon inscribed in a circle and you increase the number of sides, the area increases. It's always less than the area of the circle because it's inside the circle, but it's getting closer and closer to the area of the circle. And one way to uh, write this in sort of more mathematical terms, we would say, um, For every number epsilon, no matter how small, there is an inscribed polygon of area T. Let's say the area of the circle is A. There's an inscribed polygon of area T such that a minus t, we know that's positive because the polygon is inside the circle. So the area of the circle is bigger than the area of the polygon, but it's less than this small number epsilon. So given any epsilon, you can find a polygon inscribed in the circle with area so close to the area of the circle that the difference a minus t is smaller than this epsilon. If you make epsilon smaller and smaller, the number of sides of the polygon gets bigger and bigger, but this is still true for some inscribed polygon. Okay. Any questions about that? And it works, uh, there's a similar statement for circumscribed polygons. That is, you might have a circle and here we have a square circumscribed, not inscribed, the circle is inside the square. And you can um, increase the number of sides of the polygon outside the circle. And you can get circumscribed 
polygons of area T such that for all epsilon greater than zero, T is bigger, This the area of this polygon is bigger than the area of the circle because the circle is inside the polygon. So T minus A is positive, but we can make, we can increase the number of sides of this polygon so much that T minus A is less than epsilon. So you can approximate the area of a circle as closely as you like with an inscribed polygon or with a circumscribed polygon. Okay, so this is, in the text, this is called Proposition 1 of Archimedes. It says the following. The area of any circle is equal to a right triangle, a right angled triangle. So here's a right triangle in which one of the sides, so here's my circle. It has some radius r, circumference so that's the radius, circumference c, and area a. So the area of the circle is going to be the same as that of a right angle triangle in which one of the sides about the right angle is equal to the radius. So this side is R. And the other is equal to the circumference. C. Well, okay, so this is the claim. If you take this right triangle and this circle, the two areas are equal. Now, we'll show after we prove this, that this implies that the area of a circle was pi r squared, where pi was the number, is the ratio of circumference uh, to radius. But this is the way we do this. This is So this is really the great theorem. Um, so this is what we want to prove. So how do we prove this? Suppose we let T be the area of the triangle. So this triangle has area T, and suppose we let A be the area of the circle. Right? There are three cases, three possibilities. So prove, three cases. Case one, the area of the triangle is less than the area of the circle. Case two, the area of the triangle is bigger than the area of the circle. And case three, the area of the triangle equals the area of the circle. So the first thing you have to convince yourself of, even though it's 
once you see it, it's very simple. These are the only three cases and they're mutually exclusive, right? If you have two numbers, T and A, either T is strictly smaller than A, or T is strictly bigger than A, or T is equal to A, right? And this is what we want to prove. So you could prove it, and then you're done. But it's something else you can do is t less than a, show that's impossible. t bigger than a, show that's impossible. Then there are only three cases. If two of them are impossible, the third has to be true. So if you can prove that t less than a is impossible, and t bigger than a is impossible, then t equals a. So this is a kind of proof by double contradiction. If there are two alternatives and you show one's impossible, the other has to be true. Here there are three alternatives. We show two are impossible, so the third has to be true. So that, that's the idea. Okay, and we're going to improve, we're going to show that the first case is impossible by using an inscribed polygon. So this will be a proof by contradiction. So I'm going to assume the area of the circle is strictly bigger than the area of the triangle and derive a contradiction. So, so now I'm dealing with Case one, I want to show T less than A is impossible. So I will assume T is not less than A. Sorry, I want to show it's impossible. So assume T is actually less than A. I want to derive a contradiction. Remember, T is the area of the triangle. A is the area of the circle. So if T is less than A, that means that A minus T is some positive number. And... So Archimedes know, knew that if you have a circle, you can inscribe a polygon in the circle where the difference between the area of the polygon and the area of the circle is as small as you like. So, so Archimedes said, there is a polygon inscribed in the circle, a regular polygon inscribed in the circle such that the area of the circle, which is A, minus the area of the inscribed polygon, you can choose a polygon to make this difference as small as we like. <laughs> we know this is positive because the polygon's inside the circle, but we can make this smaller than this positive number, A minus T. So the area of the circle, A, A minus the area of the polygon is less than A minus T. If you cancel the A's and rearrange this, this says that T, the area of the triangle, is less than the area of the inscribed polygon. Now, we had a formula for the area of an inscribed polygon. Here's the polygon. 
if the perimeter is Q and the apothem is H, the area of the polygon is one half HQ. So the area of the triangle is less than one half HQ for this inscribed polygon. Now, Q is the perimeter of the polygon. It's inscribed in the circle, so Q is certainly less than the circumference. And the apothem is the distance from the center to a side of the inscribed polygon, H. And if you keep going a little bit, you get to the circle, you get to the radius. So H is less than the radius. So this is less than one half R times C. H is less than R, Q is less than C. So T is less than a half RC, but that's equal to the area of the triangle. The area of the triangle is a half the base times the height. So T is less than T, strictly less than T. This is impossible. So we have a contradiction. So T less than A, so case one, T less than A is impossible. So we can cross out case one. That cannot happen. So what about case two? Case two was the case when the area of the triangle is bigger than A. And I will show this is also impossible. So let's look at that. Case two. T bigger than A. Again, remember, you have a right triangle. This is the base B, which is the circumference. This is the altitude, which is the radius. And the area, T, is a half RC. So suppose T is bigger than A, which implies T minus A is positive. So we have, so there is an a circumscribed regular polygon. That is, you can circumscribe a polygon around the circle such that the different, now the polygon contains the circle. So the area of the polygon is bigger than the area of the circle, which is A. So the area of the polygon is bigger than the area of the circle. So the difference, area of the polygon minus A is positive. That's some positive number. And you can find, sorry, <clears throat> If you have any circumscribed polygon, the area of the polygon is bigger than the area of the circle. So, again, case two, we're assuming the area of the triangle is bigger than the area of the circle. 
So T minus A is positive. And you can find an inscribed polygon, let me write it like this, such that the area of the polygon minus the area of the circle, I can choose the area, the polygon, to make this difference as small as I like. So I can make this less than T minus A, which is some positive number, and this is bigger than zero. If I cancel the A's, this says that the area of the polygon is less than the area of the circle, which is a half RC. What is the area of the polygon? Well, in this inscribed polygon, each side is tangent to the circle. So the apothem H is equal to R. But the polygon contains the circle. So the perimeter Q of the polygon is bigger than the circumference, right? This polygon is con it contains the circle. So for example, if you had like a square, you had the circle inscribed in the square, the perimeter of the square is bigger than the circumference of the circle. But what is the area of the polygon? The area of the polygon is one half HQ, which is H is R and Q is bigger than C. So this is one half HQ is bigger than one half RC. For the circumscribed polygon, its area is bigger, its area is a half HQ, H is the same as R, and Q is bigger than the circumference C. So a half HQ is bigger than a half RC. That's less than T. The area of the polygon is less than T, but a half RC is T. And again, we have T is less than T, which is impossible. So case one, T less than A, impossible. Case two, T bigger than A, impossible. Case three, T equal to A. I don't have to prove it, I'm done. Because if these two are impossible, that's true. So this is the sort of proof. It's not infinitely long, but there are ideas in all these proofs and that are worth thinking about. Any questions about this? So I still am not done with areas pi r squared, but what we did just prove is you have a circle, radius r, circumference c, the area is equal to one half rc. You had the right triangle with sides R and C. The area of this right triangle is exactly the area of the circle. Now, What is the relationship to pi? Well, we also have, so this is the radius. 
we have that the diameter is two times the radius. And that C over D, that ratio is pi. This is the definition of pi. So C is pi times D. Which if you like, D is two times the radius is two pi R. So if I plug this into the formula, the area of the circle, A, is a half RC, which is a half R times 2 pi R. The twos cancel. And you get pi R squared. Now, what is pi? Numerically. I mean, they teach you that pi is 3.1428, whatever, right? In fact, um, the decimal expansion of pi, if you're using decimal expansions, goes on forever. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. But the Greeks didn't have decimals. They just had fractions. And Archimedes' estimate of pi is truly amazing. Archimedes proved that pi is less than 3 and a 7th and greater than three and 10 over 71. How good is this numerically? How close are these two numbers? So this is 22 over seven. I take my calculator, 22 divided by seven is 3.1428573 3 and 10 over this is 200 and 210 213 223 over 71 i think 223 divided by 71 is, did I do that right? Um, 223 over 71. It gives you a different answer. What? When I did 223 divided by 71, it gives me a different answer from, like, I think what, um, it gives me 3.1408. So I get 3.1408. Is that what you got? Yes. Yeah. So... Yeah, okay. 3.1, actually it's in the book too. I didn't even see that. 3.140845, 3.142857. So this has pi accurate to a thousandth, basically. It has 3.14 something, right? I mean, this is an amazingly good approximation to pi, given the state of the art uh, at the time.
So this is numerically what pi is. Um, okay, so this is the great theorem in chapter four. It's Archimedes' proof that the area of a circle is pi r squared, um, which had not been known before him. Now, calculating decimal digits of pi is very interesting. So um, let me just add this. The decimal expansion of pi is today a mystery. So decimal digits of pi have been computed to the trillions and trillions and trillions, but no pattern has ever been found. You know, if you take a number like, um, I don't know, um, three divided by seven. Let me use maple for this because um, let me scale this. Um, share screen. Do I have maple? Let's see. Can you see the maple screen now? No. No. Let me try it again. Share screen. How about now? Yes. Okay. So. So if I have the number three over seven, and I put that into maple, it just gives me three over seven. Um, but if I want to evaluate it as a decimal, I can use this command. Huh. Now, that's three over seven. Uh, suppose I want more digits. Um, Try it again. Uh huh. Four two eight five seven one. Four two eight five seven one. Four two eight five seven one. Suppose I want, uh, I don't know, a thousand digits. That's more exciting. Now, if you look at this, you see this pattern, 4285, it just repeats forever. So this, if I take three sevenths and write it as a decimal, I get this repeating decimal. In fact, what's true is if you take any fraction and you write it as a decimal, it's always repeating at least from some point on. Um, let's take another example. I'll just throw in some numbers at random. Um, there we go. So is there some repeating pattern in this? I don't know. Let's see. Anyone see a pattern? There should be a pattern. Actually, hard to find, isn't it? Um. 
Here we have 2,000 digits. I'm trying to find a pattern. So if anyone sees a pattern, let me know. Make this number not so small. Let's try that. So there's a number, a little bit bigger than a half. Now, can I find a pattern in here? I have 2,000 digits of this number. It will be a pattern, but I don't know how long until the pattern kicks in. There's, you can have some initial whatever, and then you get the pattern. Um, plus, the pattern can be really so long that it's like more than a few thousand digits. Huh. Let me make this a little bit smaller and see if I can recognize something that's happening. There we go. How about that number? Again, it should have a repeating decimal somewhere. See here, I see one one four two four, and here I see one one four two four, but I don't seem to be able to break this output up into separate lines. Uh, professor, on the bottom, it says one 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 four two four. not all the way to the bottom, but one, two, three, four. Go counting from the bottom right there. Yes. Right. I don't know if that's the pattern. Well, it, it'll be a period that, like, say, here is, you see it. Um, let's see. Let me see. I just repeated it, so let's see. You said one one four two four. Where was that? Yeah, you had found the first one, and then I saw the other one from the bottom counting up on the fifth row. Mm -hmm. Where was another one? Right, is it there? Right there, where your cursor is at. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's not hard to prove. I'm not going to that if if you take any fraction, and you expand it as a decimal, it'll be an infinite decimal, and it, but it repeats from some point on. 
but the period could be extremely long. But with pi, no one is, it doesn't repeat, and no one has ever found any pattern. It's a real mystery. In fact, <laughs> when supercomputers were new, different computer manufacturers would compete. You know, they'd say, buy my computer because it's faster than anyone else's computer. And how do you compare the speed of two computers? One test that was used was to use the computer to compute the decimal digits of pi. So IBM would say, we've computed the first trillion decimal digits of pi. And then Fujitsu would say, well, we can do better. We can compute the first two, million, two trillion decimal digits. And calculating the decimal expansion of pi was one of the tests that was used to determine the speed of a supercomputer. Um, and, and no one has ever found any pattern. There has to be a pattern somewhere in the decimal digits of pi, but no one has ever found it. Anyway, it's an interesting thing. If you're interested in computer science, you might look at patterns for pi, but it's a very frustrating thing because no one's been able to do it. Okay. All right. So um, so I managed to do what I wanted to do today, which was to review the classification of the regular polyhedra, to review the Euclidean algorithm, and to begin the discussion of Archimedes with the proof of what is the great theorem in the book uh, for Archimedes, which is the area of the circle was pi r squared. Uh, so next week, we're back to our regular schedule, Monday and Wednesday. And on Monday, I'll continue to talk about um, chapter four and the work of Archimedes. Um, we have, uh, and after that, uh, we have our last chapter on geometry, which has to do with, we're jumping ahead a few hundred years, to a formula for calculating the area of a triangle. You know, um, what is the area of a triangle? Uh, you have a triangle. You have the base. You have the height. And the area is a half the base times the height. Trouble is, how do you find the height? What you're often given when you have a triangle are the three sides, A, B, and C. So can you find a formula for the area of a triangle using A, B, and C, the lengths of the sides and not uh, the height? And for this, this is what will be start next Wednesday, I think. There's a formula due to the Greek mathematician Heron. He deserves to have his name legible. Heron's formula. So the perimeter of the triangle is A plus B plus C. So half the perimeter is A plus, a plus B plus C over two. So let's call that um, S. This is the semi-perimeter, which is half the perimeter. So if you know A, B, and C, you know the perimeter and you know the semi-perimeter. And Heron's formula for the area of the triangle, the area is equal to the square root of S times S minus A, S minus B, S minus C. So if you have a triangle with three sides of lengths A, B, and C, this is the area of the triangle. It's all really very, very, very nice stuff. Okay. That, I guess, is it for today. I remind you, I have uh, problem sessions tonight at 7 and tomorrow in the afternoon at 4.30. Uh -huh. And you're encouraged to log on and ask questions about anything you want to ask questions about.